Hello everyone and welcome to another edition of AOS Close-Ups. This week we'll explore the kings, warlords, and tyrants who make up the ever-chosen's inner circle, the Varengard. We take a look at their background, the rules, and how they match up against other hero-esque cavalry. Eight, the sacred number of the Pantheon of Chaos. Eight degrees of worship, eight means of corruption, eight paths of destruction. The true embodiment of these paths are given form in the Everchosen's eight circles of the Varengard. The first circle, the Swords of Chaos, Archeon's chosen champions and his right hand of destruction. The second circle, the Souls of Torment, Heralds of torture and emissaries of fear, spreading terror as the vanguard for the vast hosts of chaos. The third circle, scions of darkness, raiders who spread darkness and dread as they leap from the shadows. The fourth circle, the reavers of chaos, merciless pillagers that raise all lands they tread upon. The fifth circle, the scourges of fate, the kingslayers, the topplers of nations. Not one soul has lived once singled out to be these knights' quarry. The Sixth Circle, the Blades of Destruction, Archeon's Siege Breakers. No matter how high, all walls crumble before them. The Seventh Circle, the Bane Sons, cannibals that promise a fate worse than mere death. And finally, the Eighth Circle, not one soul has lived to pass on the name of these mysterious monsters. When sent forth to defeat an enemy, there are no bodies or ruins left, only dust remains. All eight circles fluctuate in prominence in the eyes of the Dark Lord, rising in favor based on the swinging, destructive moods of Archeon. However, the first circle does stand as the right hand of Chaos, and will march by his side when the gates of Azir are finally breached. Now, ambition alone isn't nearly enough to secure a position in one of the eight circles. A warrior must be called forth to serve the Ever Chosen, and so Archeon commands his gaunt summoners to constantly scour the realms for warriors of skill and destiny to prove themselves before him. The summoners call upon their findings with signs of chaos, such as the lightness of the Ever Chosen in the flames of a burning keep, or a buzzing voice beckoning through the sound of a thousand flies. From that point, these warriors must begin their pilgrimage, and it is no easy task. This path comes with eight arduous trials before they can stand before the ever chosen to be judged. These paths lead to many different destinations. Some travel to the eternal siege of Varenspire, hoping to gain access to the ever chosen's vacant throne room. There they are given glory or abandoned, broken, and forgotten. Others find their way to the great finding pits at eight points, where they face off in one final challenge against the other travelers of the path. No matter the path, sacrifice is demanded by the Ever Chosen. Many will sacrifice those loyal followers who help the aspirant on their path. Others sacrifice their faith and loyalty to the Dark Gods themselves. The Ever Chosen seeks total allegiance from his followers, and through their obedience to him alone do they serve the Dark Gods. Alright, so looking at them, it's definitely easy to say that they're heroes in their own right when it comes to these rules uh, a lot of the heroes out there have five wounds these guys have that these guys have a three plus save that's better than a lot of heroes that we've gone over so far so that's an incredible save to have they have a nine bravery when you combine that with the five wounds you're just not going to lose anything to battle shock tests your opponent's really gonna have to bring a lot of modifiers into play for that to even be an issue and then finally of course they are very very fast with the 10 inch move now I guess as a silver lining for your opponent, I guess the one drawback they have is they come with a very hefty uh, price tag. They are $100 to buy, so that's, that's one, um, I guess, roadblock to getting them in your army. Uh, but also they're 360 points apiece, so that puts them at, at average 120 points per model. And when we look across the whole score of heroes out there, I would say that the average points level for a hero is about 80 to 100. So in that comparison, they're a little bit more expensive than most of the heroes out there. So I think that's what really makes them fair if you're interested in competitive play. 
the points reflects how good they're going to be. So looking at their weapon options, these are very distinct weapons. Uh, they each serve a certain purpose. So let's go ahead and explore those. All right, so our first weapon option isn't shiny, but it's incredibly reliable and accurate. It comes with six attacks, hits on threes, wounds on threes, has a negative one rand, I love that, and does one damage. So an overall great weapon for any situation. Of course, I think it really shines against things that have a six up or five up save, making those things die in droves. Uh, but overall, uh, a dependable weapon that you, you, you'll probably want to take more times than not. However, we look at the other weapon options, and they may be more situational, but they're not bad themselves. When we look at the base stats, I know for the Fell Spear, it's probably unimpressive. It has half the amount of attacks. Still hits on a 3-up, but unfortunately it only wounds 50-50 in comparison to the other weapon option. It comes with a negative 1 rend, and I guess to make up for its deficiencies, it comes with a 2 damage spread. Now, you probably look at this and you're thinking, well, I would rather have the, the ensorcered weapon. It's way more reliable. But it does have its uses because it has a special rule that says on the charge, it's to wound improves to a 3-up, and it gets a very impressive negative 2 rend. That makes them, on the charge, more effective at maybe uh, getting rid of those sturdier uh, units out there. The things that have two wounds, the things that have a four up save that may be in cover, or those things that do have an innate three up save. I think this is what the fell spear is for. Of course, you do have to get the charge, but really that's not gonna be too hard with a 10 inch move. Now before we move on to the third weapon option, I just wanna touch on the mount attacks. There's three of them. Uh, they hit 50-50, they wound on 3-up, there's no rend and it only does 1 damage. And really all I can say about this is there's definitely no Dracoth. So we move on to our final weapon options. Definitely the most peculiar of them all, but I think there's still some usefulness for it. The Demon Forged Blade. It has 4 attacks, hits on a 3-up, wounds 50-50 just like the spear, comes with the negative 1 rend like the rest of the weapons, uh, only does 1 damage. Now this weapon sits in the position of being a mortal wound generator. Uh, it's not guaranteed, but it does give them out. So any six to hit will generate a mortal wound on a two or better, and effectively helping this weapon improve uh, its wounding uh, from a four up to a two up. Of course, if you roll a one, you wound yourself. Such is chaos and its special rules. Uh, so you do want to keep that in mind. So if you're playing the non-competitive version, you're following the rules verbatim, this isn't a bad weapon choice against things that get a one-up save. I know some people do play that way because that's how the rules are written, and uh, this is a great way to get around that. Uh, on the competitive side, uh, not entirely sure if you'd really want this over the two other options, um, but you do want mortal wounds in your army regardless, and maybe this is the way you want to bring them into your force. I don't know if I'm totally convinced of that logic, but that's something to consider. Now also on this page here we have a special rule that is incredible for the unit itself and kind of goes along with these weapon options. It allows the unit once per game to attack twice. <laughs> so that's 12 attacks for the guys with ensorcerable weapons, devastating against any uh, lightly armored horde. When it comes to the fell spears, they count as charging for the turn, so that's going to be uh, ending up six attacks with the impressive stats it gets for the charge. And then of course if you're going against a monster and you're feeling lucky, um, you can generate a lot more mortal wounds with eight attacks from the Demon Forged Blade. So an incredible special rule, definitely showing us why they cost 360 points for three. Well, that and another whole list of special rules. So <laughs> on the defensive side of things, they have a unique role, a rule uh, called Warp Steel Shields, and this gives them a 50-50 chance of just ignoring anything about a spell. Not just wounds or mortal wounds, but anything. So if you maybe have a wizard that can give a negative modifier to a unit, these guys will ignore it half the time. So it really is probably going to dissuade your opponent from even targeting them, uh, unless of course they're the only thing to target. So a very cool rule to have, and uh, something I haven't seen before in other editions. Uh, now, next we have some synergies that come into play if you bring the Everchosen on the board also. Uh, first up, if you just bring the Everchosen, all your Vanguard <laughs> get an insane ability to have a plus one to hit. So that means all their weapons are hitting on a two up, just making them incredibly devastating. Now, if the Everchosen uses his without equal command ability, 
Uh, they also get a contingent rerolls for charging, further guaranteeing you'll get the charge off, which is very important for if you have spheres, for example. Now the other ability uh, is pretty good. It creates a little bit of synergy outside of the Ever Chosen and the Varengard in the fact that there's a lot of things in the Chaos Faction that give you special rules based on the mark you have. So uh, every turn, Archeon can bestow a special mark on the Varengard, and I'm sure if you want to build a list around stuff like that, you, these uh, Varengard will be very thankful for receiving those marks. I know that uh, Corrin gives out a lot of extra attacks, so that will be helpful to make them even more killier. Uh, I know Zinch also has ways to reroll armor saves, which will be incredible for a 3-up armor save. So, uh, this is something you want to keep in mind when building your list. In itself, it's purposeless, but uh, you can definitely make it have an impact. Alright, so we all know there just isn't really a fair comparison to many of those hero s cab out there. And by that I mean the Gore Gruntas, the Skull Crushers, the Mourn Fang, and those other 5 plus wound cavalry out there. Uh, they just aren't as, on the whole, as tough, as fast, or as killy as the Varengard package. You of course get more for the points because of this, but toe to toe, it's really no comparison. So what does that really leave us with? The Glory Boys, the Dracoth Paladins in their many incarnations. So with the Dracoth Riders, they come in at 240 points for two compared to the 360 points for three. So I guess the base unit sizes give the edge to the Baron Guard, but really this is hardly a hard and fast advantage. Uh, you can easily get around this. You just bring the same amount. So if we looked at any unit of say six Baron Guard versus a unit of six Dracoth Knights, uh, we, I think we'll get a better appreciation for the comparison as 120 point models essentially. Now, whereas the mounts of the Varengard are kind of background to the riders, the Dracoths on the other hand are standouts uh, because in any given turn I think they can outshine their riders. They have the advantage of being more accurate and having a Ren characteristic foremost but they also come with some potentially devastating rules that I think are almost guaranteed in, say, a unit of six in our comparison here. Uh, that rule, of course, is intolerable damage, and this gives their to wound rolls of a six or more a d6 damage characteristic. <laughs> That's just, well, the Varengar mounts are, well, they're, they just have background attacks or nothing like that. Uh, when we compare the riders of the Varengar, uh, to the riders of the Dracoth riders, well, I think the advantage goes to the Varengard in the sense that they're generating more accurate attacks, particularly if they ever chosen on the board because now they're hitting on a two up. But the fact of the matter is that they only have a negative one Ren, so despite all these attacks, they're just not going to be as. That's pretty effective, of, say, against five plus armor save hordes, but probably not so much against those three plus armor knights sitting on five wounds. Now on the other hand, the good guys have a variety of different weapons, none of which generate as many accurate attacks inherently, I should say. But they all come with their own special rules that do higher amounts of damage. For example, full mayors can do three damage on the charge. Concussors can do auto mortal wounds on hit rolls of sixes, plus the normal damage still. And they stun any models that don't die. Um, look into the rules to see the implications of that. A unit of Desolators can generate just as many attacks, and in our scenario they will. They will generate as many as the Varen Guard with six, uh, but these attacks thankfully are not as accurate, but of course they will do two wounds apiece if they get through. So considering all this, I barely give the edge to the Varen Guard armed with uh, ensorcelled weapons against say the Desolators and the Fulminators but I definitely would not give them the advantage over the concussors when it comes to offense. However, even saying that, all versions of the Dracoths hold the edge in defense thanks to those Sigmar Art shields. Uh, this allows them to reroll any ones for saves, so in this comparison, uh, the Varengard would knock the Dracoth down to say a 4 plus armor save, but they're also being able to reroll ones. 
Whereas the Varian Guard Shields, while terrific, are definitely more situational, and in this matchup, they're not serving any purpose. So I think that is definitely an edge to the good guys when it comes to the defense. Now finally, I think the real decider here is the range advantage the good guys have over the Varian Guard. The Dracoths all have D3, 3 plus auto mortal wound shooting attacks. That will double up on mortal wounds if within 3 inches. Add to that, we'll look at the one uh, unit we haven't really looked at, the Tempestors. They may not be as lethal when it comes to shooting because they don't have a rend and they wound on a 50-50, but they do have a special ability that will help them win the attrition game when it comes to combat, and that's the uh, Disrupted Fire special rule. So even though they may not do any wounds uh, in the long run, or devastating wounds from that weapon alone, uh, they can probably make it very difficult for the Varen Guard, giving them a negative one to hit and just shooting them with those those moral wounds from the from the mounts. While I'd say the Varen Guard are utterly, utterly fantastic competition to a vast majority of these comparable hero cav, they are just no match for the good guy versions of themselves. And that will conclude this episode of AOS Close-Ups. Please like and subscribe. Feel free to comment below about what unit you'd like to see next, and thank you for watching.